Good afternoon, Townsend Harris. Thank you so much for joining us in our speaker series. This is our third of our speaker series. Our wonderful guest presenter today is Lindsay Duell. Lindsay has presented to our faculty last year and has presented to our students multiple times over the years. Many of our students are part of Gen Q, which Lindsay runs and does this amazing job of making all of our students feel safe and comfortable and has helped lead some of our work in making Townsend Harris more inclusive. And I thank you for always doing that and for always being so willing to work with us. I'm really excited about our conversation today. We're going to have conversations regarding the LGBTQ student body and students and very sex positive conversations, which would, I think it's going to be a fun little roller coaster that we're going to take together. So Lindsay, I'm going to pass it over to you. Again, thank you everyone for coming. I am going to continue to let people in as much as you could possibly keep your camera on. I would appreciate it so we could have this conversation together and be one community and go Townsend Harris. <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. York, for such a wonderful, loving introduction. I'm so excited to be here today and I'm really honored to have been invited to partake in this speaker series. I out of all the schools I work with, Townsend Harris is one of the schools that I've felt most welcomed by, most supported by. And I know that the young people that I work with that go to Townsend Harris, like our LGBTQ young people, often feel so much more supported at Townsend Harris than many of our other students do at other schools. So we hope that the rest of the schools can strive a bit more to be, uh, to mirror some of the work that all of you do and have this great visibility among staff members, among students, um, and a real understanding of the nuances of gender identity and sexual orientation. So we're grateful to be partnered with all of you. Um, so the way today will go is that I want to keep it as fun and interactive as possible. I know that we're all Zoom fatigued all the time. So we're going to do some polls. Um, there's going to be a lot of questions. So I really encourage that and I ask questions if as many of you as possible can respond to questions either in the chat box or you can raise your hand and unmute yourselves. Um, the, the more participation, the better. I've left a lot of time today to just kind of see where the conversation goes. I have my bullet points, I have my ideas of things that I wanna talk about, but I would love for this to be pretty open-ended. Um, so I'll share a bit about me and we'll go from there. So my name is Lindsay Duell. I am, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am the director of Generation Q, which is an LGBTQ youth program in Forest Hills, Queens. Uh, we've been around since the year 2000, and we were started by council member Danny Drum, who was, I think, I never remember if he was one of the first or the first openly gay uh, school teacher in the New York City Department of Education. So he fought really, really hard to get inclusive curriculum, this Rainbow Families curriculum into the Department of Education and fought so, so hard. And at a time where the AIDS crisis was rampant and there was so much stigma, so much homophobia. I mean, transphobia wasn't even a word that was in people's vocabulary, but you know, the transphobia was just unimaginable at the time. So we were, founded by Danny when he realized that there was this deep need for everyone in the LGBTQ community in Queens to be supported, um, but especially young people. So the first meetings of Generation Q started off in a living room in Forest Hills um, of a social worker named Larry Menzies. So he co-founded Generation Q along with, with council member Drum. And they had small groups initially coming in, talking about what was going on in their lives. And then Larry and um, Danny John came together and said, why don't we come up with some sort of event, a queer prom? So they decided to host a queer prom in Kew Gardens. And what happened was, was that it exploded and they had about 300 people there, 300 young people. And they said, we need something more than this. Clearly, there is such a need and a desire for programming like this in Queens. Um, so what can we do? So then from there, that was when um, Generation Q was founded and started and has been evolving ever since. Um, so I'm honored to have been able to take over as one of the directors in a line of some really wonderful people. And 
I've been there since August 2016. So I'm about to reach my four and a half year anniversary, which is pretty wild. Um, so I'll get into a bit more about my work, but I just want to tell you a bit about who I am as an individual. Um, so I identify as a woman. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a cisgender, bisexual, white Jewish woman who grew up on Long Island in a middle class family um, with a lot of opportunity for upward mobility. So I've exhibited a lot of privilege in my life. I have a master's degree in human sexuality studies. And I just think it's important entering into this space and talking about some of the things I'll be discussing today. It's important for everyone to be aware of the privileges that I've had in my life that have allowed me to get to this place um, and acknowledging that you know, we need to work to bridge a lot of these inequities that stop people from receiving the type of opportunities that, you know, I myself with my identities have have been afforded. Um, and that's something that we really try to do in Generation Q is, is kind of name some of those gaps and how can we support our young people on an individual level to, to uh, strive for more opportunities and to support them in seeking those opportunities. Um, so if there are any questions throughout my talking today, feel free to write them in the chat. You can always use the hand raise emoji. If there is a question that you want to ask anonymously, you can also message me directly. Feel free to do that. Um, so I'm moving along. I studied psychology in undergraduate. I actually wanted to be a veterinarian when I first started college and I started at University of Delaware, ended up moving back home to Long Island, went to community college for a year, and then actually graduated from Queens College, which was a great experience with a bachelor's in psychology. And then I went and studied abroad in Ecuador for a year where, or not studied abroad, traveled with a, with a friend, but did it. Um, I worked at an international school and taught several different topics to students. And that was where I was doing my applying to graduate school. And I had realized that I really enjoyed talking about sexuality education and sexual health. Um, and I had done some time working at an internship at Planned Parenthood on Long Island and realizing this is actually the area I feel super passionate about. And I think we live in a world where it's super, super taboo and off limits to talk about a lot of sexuality topics. And we talk about them in a very sterile, scientific way. And we often are talking about sex and sexuality um, in response and reactions to things that are coming up. We're not doing it in a proactive educational way. There's a lot of fear tactics and fear mongering that we use in sex education. So part of my work that I strive to do is to shift away from this. And how do we incorporate conversations about pleasure and lots of reasons why people engage in sexual behaviors. Um, so, you know, knowing that that was an area of interest for me, but not realizing that that was a career path that I could pursue. So as I started researching while I was away in Ecuador, um, I found this graduate program at Widener University in Pennsylvania and took out a lot of student loans that I'm still paying off and uh, will be for a very long time. So let's hope for some better student loan forgiveness. And um, that was an eye-opening place for me to be at Widener University. Um, Widener has been struggling with some, some students calling out some racism and some lack of diversity among students, among, amongst professors. Um, and, but, and when I was there, those conversations were starting to happen. But at the same time, that was a place where I was starting to have the most prominent conversations that I had ever had in my life about race and racism and privilege and gender and sexual orientation and learning about different pronouns. And, you know, I didn't always have this expertise in the area of you know, working with LGBTQ young people. This was a journey for me. And um, it was it was an eye opening, really beautiful journey of getting to have some really, really challenging conversations and being able to to understand the places that I came from and not talking about um, 
the intersections of racism and sexuality and classism and sexuality education and how we can't have a conversation about sexuality education without acknowledging all of these other oppressions that exist. Um, even in an organization like Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood has done a really good job in recent years of remedying a lot of these things, but Planned Parenthood was initially founded on this foundation of eugenics and um, providing birth control for lower, this desire to provide birth control for lower income women to, uh, to discourage them from having children, especially women of color. So there's a, a deep history of eugenics there. So learning in graduate school about a lot of this and the foundations of our sexuality education that exists in the United States and being able to compare it to other places in the world um, was really, really eye-opening. And existing in that sex positive space where topics were not off limits and realizing how much of my own sexuality education in either formally or informally uh, had so much taboo and so much shame and so much guilt around it. Um, so my first question for everyone today is, what do you think a sexuality educator does? What do you think are some of the topics that a sexuality educa educator might talk about? Um, what do you think some of the areas that we might specialize in might be? So I would love to get as many ideas as possible in this chat. And if people want to share out loud, feel free. And you can also, if you don't want to share directly with everyone, you can message it to me and I will share it anonymously. Yes, yeah, so we have educated about sexuality. We have sexual health, STDs, sexually transmitted, sexually transmitted diseases, which um, we're we're seeing a shift towards calling them sexually transmitted infections. Um, that was my goal. Yeah, so why, well, actually I'll just share since people are still going. So we've started calling them sexually transmitted infections because disease has this really negative connotation around it. Um, so calling it an infection makes it feel a lot less permanent or a lot less serious. Thanks, Ms. York. I love teachable moments. So we have consent, educate us on safe sex. And as a sexuality educator, I like to call it safer sex because there is no such thing as 100% safe sex uh, when you're engaging with someone else. There's always some sort of small risk, whether it's pregnancy or contracting a sexually transmitted infection, um, you know, even something like getting a UTI after having sex, a urinary tract infection, or something like bacterial vaginosis, which are not STIs, but there's always some sort of small risk involved in, in, sexual, in sexual acts. We have religion and sexuality, healthy relationships, sexual responsibility, discrimination, gender identity, reproductive anatomy, communicate with your family. Amazing. Oh, I love all of these so much. Yes, sexuality educators do all of these things and so much more. And a lot of the time, or I ask that question because I think a lot of the time, some of the misconceptions are that sexuality educators are these really kind of outrageous people who have, you know, no shame, which is true. I like to think I have no shame in talking about sexuality related topics, but, um, you know, I'm not always just brash and talking about the most um, explicit things, though that can happen sometimes. But this is, Sexuality education um, is also about communication and healthy relationships and setting boundaries. So sexuality education can teach us skills for other areas of our lives outside of um, our intimate relationships and our sexual relationships. So we talked about puberty, we talked to young people about boundaries and, and you know, good touch versus bad touch. There's a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, there is a question here. Why is infection a more positive connotation than disease? Um, I, so I'm not totally sure why that's the case. I know 
personally for me, when I hear infection, I think of it as something a bit less chronic, a bit more temporary, a bit less serious. Um, but if anyone else wants to chime in why they think that might be, I'd, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. I would say intense or short disease sounds like permanent long-term where infection, everyone in this room has had an infection. Not everyone in this room has had a disease. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's a great response, Jonathan, thanks. Um, and I think that's a great question. This is the thing that I love about talking about sexuality education is I'm always being challenged in my beliefs too. I'm just gonna stand up and open my window. It's not very warm. <laughs> Great question. So I want more questions like that. Challenge me. Um, maybe ask the questions that you don't always feel comfortable asking in other spaces. All right. So, um, so some of the, just back to some of the work that I do at Generation Q, and it's so great to see some familiar faces here. Um, we are in non-COVID times, we are, we function as a drop-in youth center. So essentially an after-school space where young people can come in, hang out, spend some time together, but also, also get some educational resources, some mental health resources, and we do things like play Jackbox and Minecraft and um, Among Us, that's the new one that they taught me about. <laughs> they also school me in like, as you saw on the flyer, meme culture. I knew nothing about memes before starting this job. So I learn a lot about pop culture from the kids and it's just a really fun kind of silly, chill space to be. Um, but then we have support groups where we talk about more intense, more emotionally charged things. We talk about healthy relationships. We watch films together and have film discussions. And now we've taken everything virtual. So we are on the platform Discord. And can I just get a show of hands who is on Discord or who's familiar with it? Cool. Awesome. Also something new that I'm learning during the pandemic. And it's been great. It's been a really nice space for us to remain in communication with each other. And we have our own private server and it's, it's pretty informal. Um, and if any of the Gen Qers in here felt comfortable sharing anything, you're happy, you're welcome to. I'm happy. I'm happy to invite you to speak out loud about the program or share anything that you want to, or if you want to write in the chat, you're welcome to do that too. But no pressure. Um, so that's the gist of what we what we do. We try to offer our young people opportunities for support, um, and we try to cater to our individual participants. We we bring things to the group as a whole but we also offer more one-on-one -on -one and individualized attention depending on what our participants need. Okay. Take a peek at my notes. Okay. So since it is Respect for All Week, um, what, how do we think that sex ed and Generation Q tie into Respect for All Week? Okay, totally fine to not know. I appreciate the honesty. Um, I think that there's like, not a bad, but like people are uncomfortable with um, sex, like talking about it and sometimes shame others for being more open. So that's why um, it ties into it because into respect for all week because you want to educate others that it's something normal and it's something that you should not be um, shame you not you sorry you should not be shamed ashamed of and you should just be comfortable with talking about it and more education on it will lead to um, like a safer sex. Yeah, that was great. Amazing. Yeah. And the question was, how does how does talking about sex ed and how does talking about gender identity and sexual orientation 
how do those tie into respect for all week? There isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer. I'd just love to hear what some of you think. In the meantime, I can give some of my thoughts on, on the topic. Um, some of it is just, you know, recognizing that there are folks who identify all along this gender spectrum and all along this, or, this sexual orientation spectrum. So acknowledging that there are so many identities that exist and that everyone deserves to be respected, all identities um, and understanding that Oh, I see, okay, so I see some hands raised and I see, I'm gonna stop myself there because I wanna hear from all of you. So the more we know, the better we are able to engage with others in self-affirming and respectful ways. Um, I see a hand raised by uh, Cecily, is that how you pronounce your name? Cecily. Oh, Cecily. Oh, yeah, thanks. so I feel like um, talking about like sex and like STDs have to do with like respect for all because I feel like learning more about it, it can help you like know like what you accept and what you don't ex accept and like what your boundaries are. And like, I feel like knowing that you can like set the standard with the people that you meet and then like they can know like how to respect you and like how you would like to be respected, especially like in a top, like a topic like that is, can be sensitive um, for different people. So I feel like that's important. Um, and also like respecting yourself, like knowing what you will accept and what, what, what you won't ex accept um, is very important for others to understand. And like, if they don't accept that or like they can't um, respect that boundary, that's gonna be an issue, so yeah. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer, thank you. Um, Jenny, do you wanna share? Um, I really don't know, but um, can we repeat the question again? Yeah, so what I had asked is how, how does talking about gender identity and sexual orientation and sexuality education tie into Respect for All Week? Well, um, from, I guess, in some ethnic groups or whatever, they view, I guess, it's more like a single story, how um, people are being taught that being gay or being whatever you are is bad and you are expected to um, act like the way your role is given, like a gender is given. So people really lack the knowledge of, I guess, extend, like being open-minded and um, see the perspective of someone who is gay. Like pretend someone is discriminating a gay person. Um, well, for that person who's being discriminated, well, it, I really don't know how to um, say it, but like I think you're doing a great job. I think I, I understand what you're what you're saying. Yeah, it's for me. It's all about single stories and how people aren't being educated. Yeah. 100%. I think there's the single story is so powerful. Uh, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because um, so many reactions to sexuality or sexual orientation or gender identities that are different than what we're comfortable or familiar with are just sort of fear based or um, we're afraid to ask questions because we don't want to offend. And then we end up being almost more offensive sometimes because we're not working to build those connections with people. I'm just going to go through the messages and see. So someone said maybe that educating on sexuality makes the other less strange to less strange to them. They both deal with how to respect all kinds of people and all kinds of sexualities. Talking about it can help us break down stigmas and false information. Um, I feel like everyone has their own identity and sometimes they just want they want to just conceal it just because they are different. Yes, these are all amazing answers. I love this so much. And um, what Cecily was saying before about being able to know your own boundaries and respecting your own choices is so important. And sometimes we have to have 
experiences to know what we feel comfortable with and what we don't feel comfortable with. But the more we talk about these things, the more we're able to parse out what feels okay for us, the more we can get comfortable with talking to our friends and our partners, we can talk about our experiences and feel less shame. And just touching on sexually transmitted infections for a minute, there's a lot of shame and stigma. And thankfully, many of the sexually transmitted infections that exist can be pretty easily cured um, or easily, easily managed because there are some that are chronic. And something I'd like to talk about is herpes and some of the stigma against herpes when about 90% of individuals have some form of the herpes virus in their body. Yet we constantly continue to hear comedians and films and TV shows make fun of people with herpes. And this is so damaging. Um, I am 29 years old and I have at least four close friends of mine that have confided in me that they have some form of herpes. And the shame that comes along with that is more damaging and more debilitating than the actual virus itself. Um, the herpes virus cannot kill you. Um, for many people, it doesn't actually cause many severe side effects and symptoms, but because it can be this very visual uh, sexually transmitted infection, people have the most visceral reaction to it. Um, and what herpes is, it's it's just some it's sores that can break out on your on your genitals or around your mouth. So you can have oral or genital herpes. Um, there's still a lot of information that we're always learning about herpes, but herpes can be very manageable if you follow the directions of a doctor and if you're managing those things. Um, if you're managing some of the symptoms and it's something that lives in your body forever. Um, but I think the more that we can reduce the stigma of herpes, um, the better off everyone is. And, and the same thing with sexually transmitted infections. I think the stat is something like one in four people under the age of 25 will contract a sexually transmitted infection in their life. So this is prominent, and I think we need to be more realistic about these things. The fact that people engage in sexual behaviors and again, there's no such thing as totally safe sex um, unless you're masturbating or you know, having sex with yourself essentially. So once you bring in another person, there's just an assumed risk. And that's why it's so important to talk about these things so that we're not going in to situations naively or uninformed. Um, so, I have a couple of things that I want to do that'll be a bit interactive. So the first thing that I'm going to do is, I guess I'm, I'm bouncing all over the place right now. I have so many things that I want to talk about. How are, let me just do a quick check-in. Can I just get a feel on how we're doing so far? Do we want something? Do we want to get a little bit more immersive? Um, are we okay with the talking right now? Can I just get like a thumbs up or a thumbs down or I'm, an, I'm okay? Immersive is just more engaged where maybe I'm ask, where I'm talking less, asking for more interaction from all of you. Are we tired? Are we energized? Are we intrigued? I see some thumbs up, mostly from some of the staff. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, so then we'll keep at it. Um, so the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to share a poll everywhere and I want to get a feel for how we would define sex in this group. Um, so for poll everywhere, what I'm going to do is put this up on the screen and what I'd like everyone to do is you can get on your computer or you can do this through a phone or your iPad if you have texting on your iPad or tablet. Um, and you can go to pollev, E-V, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash Lindsay Duel 308. Or you can text Lindsay Duel 308 to 22333. And let me know if anyone else needs me to read that again. And what I want you to do is 
write in your answer, okay? And you can be, you know, explicit. I want us to try to avoid, like, let's avoid profanity. Um, but, you know, you can use genital terms. Um, and thanks for all of your feelings, your thoughts on how you're feeling. I'm so glad to hear. So if everyone wants to just start typing in, um, you can go ahead and it should be working. And I think you'll have the ability to type in, ah, there we go, thanks everyone. So it's Lindsay Dual 308. So it's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-D-U-E-L 308. That's okay. All right. All right. So I think once you, once if you're texting, what'll come up on this? Oh, that didn't work. <laughs> the green screen blocks it out. Um, it'll say you've joined Lindsay Dual session, and when you're done reply leave. So from here, what you should be able to do is just type in your responses. So Oh, and no, you don't use, need to use your real name. Oh, wait, I guess I didn't start it. I'm sorry. Hold on. <laughs> I need to get better at this. Activate. Is that what we have to do? That should work. There we go. Okay. Ah, enjoying your and your partner's bodies. Great. So we have penis and vagina sex. Enjoying your and your partner's bodies. Intercourse. A person and a person get naked and feel very good. Physical intimacy with someone. Love this. When more than one person engage in, a, in certain activities together for pleasure, an activity that's probably unnecessary unless you're having a kid, an intimate act between people, being intimate. This is so wonderful. I would define sex as an intimate act of affection and pleasure where genital parts are involved, love. Sex is when two people engage in sexual behaviors to satisfy their desire. A sexual intercourse. Physical, pleasurable, consensual intimacy. Yes. Definition one, intercourse, okay. Seems like there will be more coming from this person. Yeah, physical intimacy, not only penis and vagina involved. I would define sex as an activity with at least two people who are being intimate with genitals involved. The process by which humans create smaller humans <laughs> doesn't need to be for that. Intimacy uh, between two or more parties, genital contact with self and others. These are, I'm blown away by these responses. And we can see a common theme that it's not just, um, it's not just uh, penis and vagina. It's not just how we might label heterosexual sexual activities. Um, so I love the diversity here. And I also do wanna acknowledge that there are plenty of individuals who may only have sex for reproductive purposes, but it's also important for us to understand that there are plenty of reasons why people engage in sexual activity. Consensual pleasure either with yourself one partner or multiple partners with the intention of mutual physical satisfaction. I love that. Any sexual activity. Yeah. Ah, oh, these are so good. Okay, so I'm gonna actually stop the screen share now and just I'll go through some of these, but that totally warmed my heart and that was amazing and so much better than my understanding of sex as a young person. Um, you know, sex was, when I was learning about it, it wasn't about boundaries. For some people, it was about conquest and seeing who had the best story to share. Um, for some people, it was just about waiting until 
marriage and only engaging in sexual activity for reproduction. And there are so many reasons why people engage in sexual activity. And sex is however you would like to define it. And that's why I like to do an activity like this to show there are so many different ways for us to define sex. Um, sex for some people can just be like this intimacy of being naked next to each other. Some people could count kissing and making out as sex. So this can really differ on a person to person basis. And it's just important that we um, understand and respect this spectrum of what sex can be. And so that was beautiful. I'm so excited about that. And, and also the acknowledgement of pleasure. That was something that was always missing in the sex ed that I received. And I think there's a fear of um, educators or, or of the school systems to acknowledge that majority of the times people are engaging in sexual behavior, it is for some form of pleasure, whether mental, emotional, physical, sexual. And yeah, the acknowledgement of consent. And we're going to get dig a little bit deeper into consent soon. That's okay. That's why that's why we want this to be a shared experience so that we can see what what other people think. So that's a, a really good question, Estella. Um, so rape is not considered sex um, because sex is consensual by definition. Things, um, activities that are not consensual that involve genitals and bodies, um, if they're not consensual and not agreed upon, that can be counted as sexual assault or sexual harassment or rape. Um, but I would not, in my definition, define that as sex. Yes, I would consider that a crime um, because my definition is that it's a consensual activity that people are engaging in. And I really appreciate the acknowledgement of uh, one or more people because there are people that are in relationships that aren't monogamous and sometimes there are people that are engaging in sexual acts with more than one person so I think this is a really robust definition of sex that we've been able to explore just now um, yeah Robin I think that's that's a really good and unfortunate metaphor and those are really, really tough topics for us to talk about. Um, and I appreciate the acknowledgement of it. It's, it's really important. And for people to not feel like, oh, because I was taken advantage of, you know, that was still considered sex. You get to determine what sex was. You get to determine when you had sex for the first time and what sex for the first time looked like for you. And on that note, um, just a brief acknowledgement of the term virginity and that virginity is a social construct and leaves a lot of people out of it. So I like to call it your sexual debut or your first sexual experience. And there was a really, really good tweet that I had seen a while ago. It was like, the calling it your sexual debut is so much better because you're the star of the show. Um, and there was another one, like maybe something about costumes and then it implies that there's a musical number involved. So I just thought that was so great. And if I can find that, I will send that to Miss York and Miss Brandeis to share out with everyone. It's just so much more inclusive. The concept of virginity leaves out a lot of people. It implies innocence and purity and youth and just like cleanliness. And, you know, it's just, too neatly packaged, too narrow. Um, there's also this unfortunate, you know, I think when we think of a virginal person, we think of this like pure blonde haired white young woman. And like, there are a lot of conversations around how this idea of innocence and virginity often leaves out women of color. Um, so I think, I wish that we had more time to dig into some of that. But yeah, the virginity that we hear about feels really outdated with our, our definition of sex. The fact that you're losing something, um, the fact that someone's taking something from you and that's actually a shared experience. And it leaves out queer folks a lot of the time because this notion of losing virginity involves 
a penis person and a vagina person and usually cisgender heterosexual people. We don't talk about it in, in queer terms. Um, so one other thing that I just wanted to ask is who just in the, um, in, wow, well, words have escaped me. Um, being that it's respect for all week, who do we think that sex ed often leaves out? What identities of folks do we think it leaves out? Well, I, so I think for cis folks that like sex ed is usually catered towards them. So trans folks, asexual people, questioning students. Yeah. Yeah, Ms. Fee, I think there is definitely this, um, this assumption in sex ed that you should know exactly how you identify. Um, it le yeah, non-binary people, non-cis folk and individuals who aren't heterosexual. And like we'd think that in 2021, we'd finally be in a better place. Yeah, aromantic. Um, and also it leaves out people with different abilities. Um, we don't talk about people on the autism spectrum having sex. We don't talk about people with physical differences having sex. Um, we tend, and we may not be aware of these things, but the way that society portrays people with various, various physical or emotional or mental abilities is that they're not sexual. And we automatically gravitate towards labeling them as exactly ableism, right? We gravitate towards labeling those individuals as asexual or non-sexual. So I think this, this cognizance and awareness of that is super, super important. And when I was in graduate school, we actually learned about, um, and I think, so Edison, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think that there is a shift in this and I think there is greater accessibility to materials. Um, and there was, there have been some shows that have come out that are, that are talking more about these things, but there are definitely a greater number of resources for folks that are on the spectrum or have different physical abilities. Um, you know, we don't talk about people with visual impairments having sex. We don't talk about people who are hearing impaired having sex. It's just this like, you are, you are non-neurotypical or your body doesn't function in this way that we think it should. So therefore you can't be sexual. And there are a lot of really amazing activists doing work to counter this. So um, there's someone named Andrew Gerza uh, who is a disability activist who talks about sex and disability all the time. And I wish that I put together a list of resources now that I'm thinking about it, but what I can do is put that together and also send that over after this, because there's some really good folks doing fantastic work um, in, in these spheres and normalizing sex for, uh, you know, of age individuals who are can are informed and aware of of the risks and also the enjoyments that can come from from sex and sexuality. So I will I'm happy to put a document like that together to share out with everyone. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to screen share again, and we're going to just bounce back over to talking about consent a little bit. And there is this model of consent that I am so deeply in love with and I think it's so great. Um, and yeah, let me just go back to the chat for a second. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for responding that. It is completely normal. Um, I agree, I agree. Yeah, and that's great. I'm glad that there isn't, isn't shame. Um, so thanks everyone. I love reading this conversation going on on the side. So there is a model of consent that was created by Planned Parenthood and the acronym is FRIES, just like French fries. So it's F-R-I-E-S. So what I'm gonna do is share this. Okay, can we see that okay? Yeah. 
Okay, thanks everyone. So consent and fries go together so well. So consent is actually, can I get someone to read this out loud for, for us? Um, Ari, would you like to read? Yes, I would love to read. Okay, so uh, fry, so F, uh, freely given, R, reversible, I, informed, E, enthusiastic, and S, specific. Thank you. All right, so number one, what do we think of this? Has anyone seen it before? Does this feel like a good model for consent? Does it feel confusing? What are some of our first thoughts? Makes total sense. Makes total sense. Awesome. Um, can you elaborate on what reversible means? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Does anyone, I'd love to call in the audience, what do we think reversible means when it comes to consent? Uh, Nadia, did you wanna share? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so reversible in my interpretation is that you can at first say, yes, I would like to have sex with you, but then it's totally okay if they wanna, they change their mind and they say no all of a sudden. And that's totally fine. Exactly. That was beautiful. Yeah. So in the chat, I also saw you have the option to change your mind. Consent can be, be revoked. Um, so that's reversible. We can go through all of these. What do we think freely given means? For me, I think freely given matters a lot because it's not consent if it's go use or you're under duress either. So it needs to be in a situation where you can say no, and then we can say no later, because like I heard this in so like if I put a gun to your head and I tell you to give me your wallet and you give it to me, that's not really consent because I'm threatening you. Exactly. And the same applies to sex as well. Hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. And without man manipulation or quid pro quo, no pressure involved, right? Um, so we have freely given, which is no, without pressure, um, reversible, which means consent can be reversed or taken away at any point. Uh, what about informed? What does informed mean to us? You know what you're consenting to, you know who you're dealing with. Yeah, so informed is maybe you know a bit about the person or in a way that feels comfortable enough for you because that all differs for from person to person. Um, you know the risks involved. You have had conversations with this individual to talk about what you're comfortable with. So you have all of the information gathered. What about enthusiastic? Does that mean like I'm gonna jump up and down and just like be clapping and wearing a party hat? What is enthusiastic consent? You're not hesitant to say yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. So it wouldn't be like, uh, yeah, I guess so. It would be like, yeah, but consent can also be we also have to talk about consent and that it's not always yes is the word, right? Sometimes it can be body language, but it's also really good to check in with our partners if we're following body language. But there are times where maybe people don't have ver the verbal ability in the moment to, to consent verbally. So maybe we follow some body language cues that might be discussed with our partner ahead of time. Yeah, by enthusiastic, it means you both want to engage in that activity. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we have specific. What do we think of specific? Yes to one thing doesn't mean yes to everything. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I was yeah. about to say it's basically where you draw the line. Exactly. So I think I mean, they all go hand in hand with each other, but right, just because I am consenting to, you know, someone touching my left shoulder doesn't mean I'm okay with them touching my right shoulder. So let's be as specific as possible 
And then doing talking about all of these things ahead of time also can remove some of the awkwardness that occurs and sex can be awkward and intimacy can be awkward and that's okay. But when we follow a model like this um, and when we think about consent in this way, it can make things a lot clearer and it can make it easier for us to communicate with our partner or partners. So this is a model that is super exciting to me. Um, okay. So, how are we feeling? Do we have any related questions so far? Um, is there, are there any topics that we feel like we really wanna dig into? That's okay. All right, so, Next, I am going to screen share again, just speaking about inclusivity and respect for all and, um, you know, moving towards a world where we have, we're more neutral in our language and the way that we talk about bodies. And in sex ed, I try to keep, in the sex ed that I do with Generation Q, I try to keep it as gender neutral as possible. So, I'm gonna share another infographic that I think is really fun. Um, and it's something that I like to base a lot of my, or these concepts are something that I like to base a lot of my work off of. So this is about adapting language for diverse genders, bodies, and sexualities or asexualities. So, when talking about bodies and what they do around health issues, it's easy to make assumptions. To check your language, you can ask, am I gendering people with certain parts? So I don't like to assume what bodies people have. I like to ask all of the young people that I work with um, their pronouns, so that I'm not making assumptions about who they are, how they identify. And that's why I put my pronouns in my Zoom and my email. So everyone knows the pronouns that I like to use. So let's see if I can make this bigger. Okay, so here are some examples of ways that we use a lot of gendered language. And this is what we like to do in our world. Um, this is, it's something that we default to. But when I talk about body parts, I'll actually say like people with penises or people with vaginas instead of assuming that all women have vaginas and all men have penises. Um, sometimes I'll say penis to people, which makes the Gen Qers laugh a lot. And I didn't even realize that it was like a funny thing to say. But we can we can shift and use anatomy rather than gender. So when we're talking, we can... Um, we can switch the way that we talk about bodies in that way. So we can talk about um, people with ovaries can often get pregnant. Uh, starting with some of these steps, you can start using language that includes people who are trans or intersex and anyone, anyone whose bodies don't have parts often associated with their gender. So this language can make a really big difference for a lot of people. And this is unfortunately not something that we see a lot in the medical profession or in our health classes or biology classes. Um, you know, we'll talk about people menstruating, women menstruating and periods, but there are people, um, there are people who, you know, don't identify as women that will menstruate. Um, and I, I got a question from someone that said, why is it wrong to speak of man, woman, boy, or girl? So it's not wrong to speak of man, woman, boy, or girl. But when we're talking in more general ways, when we're not talking about specific people, this can feel a bit more inclusive. So when we're talking in um, health class or biology about bodies, it can be important to at least offer another alternative to this very like specific boxed gendered language. It's just about being really in, as inclusive as we can. Um, 
And then another question, yeah, and someone, so we could say male bodies or we can say, um, you know, people assigned male at birth. Um, and, but like someone who has a penis may not see their body as a male body. If that's, I'm not sure if that's what the, the question is. Um, and another question was, are we supposed to say them or there? So there are some people that use they, them pronouns um, as, a, as a gender neutral pronoun. And I think we see that a lot more often now, especially than when I, um, compared to when I was in high school. Um, so, you know, sometimes I will, you know, if I don't know people's pronouns, like, or I'll just refer to like individuals as, as they or them, but I actually was, um, someone shared with me recently that maybe that's not the best thing to do. So there's always learning that I'm doing too, that maybe just, if I don't know someone's pronouns, maybe I'm making an assumption about them being, you know, not being cisgender and I don't actually know how they identify. So that's why I really try to go out of my way to ask everyone that I interact with their pronouns regard, because it's not fair of me to assume um, how someone identifies. It is important to ask, definitely, definitely. Um, when I was in graduate school, it was when we were first seeing they, them pronouns become more popular and used more consistently. And I remember making a comment to one of my, one of my friends in graduate school. And I said, well, they, them doesn't feel very grammatically correct to me. What he said to me was, you know, that doesn't really matter, Lindsay, because it's not about what you think is grammatically correct. It's about what makes a person feel comfortable. And that was really, really eye opening for me. So, you know, I like to share that because there's always learning for all of us to do and we make mistakes. And there are ways to remedy those mistakes and to get better as individuals and um, realizing that language changes is so important. We still we don't use Shakespearean English any longer. Our, our language changes all the time. Yeah, and I think, I think what my thinking was back in the day was that um, they was a plural pronoun, but it's, yeah, our, our code for using language is very modern and it's always changing and there's always new ways to use words that are developing all the time. Okay, so here we just have some more like general gender neutral body language. Um, and this one I really like too. So am I gendering people I'm talking to, their partners or their parents? And a lot of the times we'll talk about people's mom and dad, or we'll be in a space and they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, or assume my, your mother gave birth to you. And there are lots of reasons why saying your mother gave birth to you might not be right. Maybe your dad is trans and gave birth to you, or maybe you were adopted and you don't actually know who your birth parent was. Um, maybe someone comes up to you and says, when you're with your boyfriend, but actually you have a girlfriend. So, um, how can we shift this to make some of these things more neutral? And so yes, trans men um, can give birth because trans men are people that were assigned female at birth. So many trans men may still have ovaries and a uterus and a vagina and vulva, and it depends on the person. Um, so this isn't an overarching statement by any means, but it's definitely possible. And there are actually several prominent stories of folks who have come out um, and shared their, their stories as pregnant trans men. And that's definitely something that you can find online too. And I, I can add that into any resources that I share. So going back to gendering, you know, some of, some of these things might resonate a little bit more with all of us as a group. So instead of saying ladies and gentlemen, we can say, hi everyone, good morning class. Hey there, cool cats. I don't know, I might roll my eyes really hard at a teacher if they said, hey there, cool cats, but to each their own. Hey there, party people, I love that. That like gets the room going. Um, I went to a school in Manhattan one day to learn about some of their 
practices um, for, for being gender inclusive and, and inclusive of all sexual orientations. And they just have really good practices. And every morning on the announcements, they would say, good morning, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, which I thought was super cute. Uh, gender neutral pronouns for partners. Are you seeing someone? What are they like? So not assuming who someone's dating. Calling someone your significant other. Partners are great, but it's healthy to have friends too. I also just learned about the term joy friend instead of, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend, which I thought was adorable. There are a lot of different gender neutral ways to refer to a partner. And then gender neutral words for family members. Do you have any siblings? Are you close to your birth parents? And this is so important to me. And this is why when people even push back on, you know, calling, saying mom and dad, you don't know who people were raised by. This can, this transcends just the LGBTQ community. This is across the board that we do not know who raised any individual. So for me personally, I had my dad in my life for a short period of time, but really it was my mom and grandmother that raised me. Um, there are people that are adopted. There are people that were raised by grandparents, by nannies, by siblings. So there, we all have different stories and different situations. So even just being mindful in that way is super important and can make, make someone feel so supported and so seen. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up the topics that I wanted to chat about today. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge that we've been on for an hour. So I understand if folks have to leave since it's Thursday and you have off tomorrow. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I do want to leave time. I did just get a question about going into depth about um, people on the autism spectrum or maybe some non-neurotypical people. And what I will say about that is that's unfortunately not my area of expertise. So I'm happy to discuss it if people have some questions, but I would probably feel a little bit more comfortable just pointing folks in the direction of some other experts who, who work in that area, in that, in those realms. So feel free to write some questions in the chat. You can ask me more about Gen Q or about sexuality education. If we have any sex ed related questions, I'm happy to answer anything that anyone has. And it's also okay if we don't. Mm. Yeah, so I got a question about discussing religion and sex. And I think that's a really important question because so much of the time um, religion is very involved in our conversations about sex and they're very intrinsically tied to one another, especially when we're talking about teaching about abstinence and refraining from sex and that it's, you know, there's a lot of religious principle and that it can be sinful to engage in sex and sexuality before marriage. Um, and I think that that's an individual on an individual basis. And I, really wish that when parents were teaching things like that to their to their young people that they at least left room for um, some exploration outside of those ideas and I think just providing options and providing education rather than just saying this is how you have to be this is these are the rules that you have to follow I wish there was a bit more room left for individual exploration around around sex and, and sexuality when it comes to religion. And every religion approaches sexuality differently. I was raised in a reformed Jewish household and um, conversations about sex were definitely not off limits. Um, I think my mom thinks she did was much more open about sex and sexuality than I actually recall her being, but there wasn't necessarily a shamefulness about talking around talking about sex. Um, so it, it really varies from religion to religion, but I think any time that shame is brought into the conversation about sex, we have a problem there because that is that shame that we carry for our entire lives. And it's really, really hard to overcome 
shame when it comes to sexuality. Um, it can really affect our sexual, uh, our sexual pleasure and our ability to kind of get out of our head or to recognize our own desires when we constantly have this, this shame around engaging in sexual behaviors in our heads. But you know what I will say is if you're an of age individual and you're following those, those Fry's guidelines and you, know, you, you make that informed choice as a consenting adult, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, you're not doing anything wrong as long as you're not harming yourself or someone else. And if you're of the age of consent in our, in our country, so I'm here to tell you that you're okay if you fulfill those categories. Um, and there is also, yeah, that's great. The best thing to do is strive for the opposite of shame, pride, definitely. Even having terms in like films and TV, like walk of shame is a huge problem. I've heard the stride of pride, which I thought was really cute. Um, there's a question about sex and intersex individuals, which I think is a great topic. Does anyone want to give us the definition of intersex? Does anyone feel it like people who have like both sex organs or something? That's actually, you know, a, a really, really common misconception of what intersex is because of the way that it's talked about in the media. Um, or is that hermaphroditic? I don't, so that's know. I don't know the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's hermaphrodi hermaphroditic, but they're all they're always conflated with each other. And the interesting origin and pretty awful origin of the word hermaphrodite. So it comes from Greek mythology, and it was um, it stems from this melding of Hermes and Aphrodite, and this masculine and feminine energy, which is not inherently problematic. But the way that the word hermaphrodite was used in Greek mythology was to describe a monster. So then the problem when that word gets translated to us as human beings and not people living in Greek mythology is that this is a word that's heavily stigmatized. And then what it came to mean was people who had two fully formed sets of genitals. So both a penis oh and a vagina and a vulva. Was there a question? Sorry, I heard someone speaking. Oh, well, wait, uh, that might have been just my background. Sorry okay. about that. All good. Wait, so I know intersex definitely has variation in sex mm -hmm. organs. Yeah, so. exactly. So that's that's more along the lines of what it is. So it's um, someone who may have ambiguous genitalia or a difference in hormones, chromosomes, or genetic makeup or physiology, other than what is typically presented, which is such a funny thing to me because there isn't, you know, we have, we have our ideas of what penises and testes and vulvas and vaginas are supposed to look like, but there's always a natural variation in what bodies look like. So there's nothing wrong with your genitals unless you're having pain or you're having issues with function, but just because you don't see, you know, what you might see in, in films or erotic art or read about, or, you know, if you're 18, what you might see in like adult pornographic materials, that is not always what our bodies are going to look like. So that's a really important thing to remember. Um, but yeah, it, so what it is, is just some physical differences. So it can be someone that has three sex chromosomes. So they can have an XXY chromosome, or they can have an XO chromosome, or they may have higher levels of testosterone than what's expected or lower levels of testosterone than what's expected. They may have um, undescended testes. Yeah, androgen sensitivity. There are dozens of conditions that are considered to be intersex and they all present differently from one, one another. I think it's really a great topic for us to all read up on because there's so many variations and a lot of the time we don't learn about these things. And many folks who are intersex often don't find out until later in life when maybe they're trying to reproduce or they're um, having some pain during sex and find out that they don't have a fully formed vaginal canal. Um, there are all these really interesting and unfortunate ways that folks may find out that they're intersex. And for a long time, medical professionals were performing unnecessary 
surgeries that were only aesthetic surgeries to normalize newborn babies' genitals. And this was super problematic because it was seen as a really unnecessary cosmetic procedure. And then they were often determining the, the sex and, you know, at the time, thereby gender of that baby without giving that, that child a choice in the matter. Maybe they would be perfectly content with having these genitals that, you know, maybe don't look as, as expected. And if they still function and um, can provide pleasure or enjoyment, that might be okay for that person. So these, these surgeries have since been stopped in our country and the, um, a lot of the, the boards of medical professionals have decided that these are unnecessary surgeries for doctors to perform. And one, I think the stats range, but I think one in every 250 individuals has an intersex condition, um, which is as common as being a natural redhead. Super interesting. Um, any other thoughts or questions, feelings? Totally open to us staying and chatting, but before people start to leave, I want to say thank you while everyone's still here. And thank you for doing this today, Lindsay. And it was absolutely amazing. And any opportunity we could set a forum to have a positive sex conversation and supporting our LGBT youth is absolutely a move in the right direction. So thank you so much for this and for what you do every day. Thank you. And thank you to Miss York and Miss Brandeis for you know, always supporting me and inviting me in. And it's just really such an honor to get to participate with such a wonderful group of young people with so many wonderful thoughts and thought provoking questions. It's, it's an honor. I agree. I think our, well, Harrisites did an amazing job today. That's how I avoid ladies and gentlemen. I just call them all Harrisites and I think Thank I'm covered. You. <laughs> but I like party people. I could rock that one. Yeah. Party people's cute.